in your love. Put my trust in your goodness and set my thoughts on peaceful things above. I will cast away my cares and find my joy. There used to be a television show, I don't know if they still have it on TV, called The World's Most Amazing Videos. Well, I watched a few episodes of that. And then there was another program called The World's Wildest Police Chases. Yeah, I watched some episodes of that. There was another program, The World's Most Amazing Car Crashes. Well, okay, you know, I watched a few episodes of that. TV loves to amaze us, doesn't it? I've seen a lot of other amazing things on television, and I'm sure you have too. Which brings up the question, what amazed Jesus? And there were only two things that amazed Jesus, and they were flip sides of the same coin. First of all, faith amazed Jesus. We're going to look at that today in Luke 7, verse 9 where it, it reads, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. And then the second thing that amazed Jesus was the opposite of faith. In Mark 6, verse 6, we read, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. Nothing else recorded in the Gospels ever amazed Jesus. And the, the word here found in our passage, Luke 7, 9, where he was amazed, is the same Greek word found in 2 Thessalonians 1, 10 that describes our amazement when Jesus returns. So here in this passage we're going to study today, Luke 7, 1 through 10, we find the only person who ever amazed Jesus. This man received the highest praise Jesus ever gave to a Gentile. And of course, a Gentile is anyone who isn't a Jew. His example teaches us what the faith that amazes Jesus looks like. And I want to point out from this passage, they come right out of this passage, six brush strokes in the portrait of the faith that amazes Jesus. Here's the first. The faith that amazes Jesus is humble. The story begins in verses one and two. When Jesus had finished saying all this in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. Now in Matthew's version of the story, Matthew says this servant was bedridden paralyzed and suffering uh, terribly. Now on to verse 3. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. So he desperately needed Jesus' help, so he sent a delegation to Jesus for that. Now verses 4 through 6. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. Now, there are two opinions about this centurion expressed here in these verses. The first one is in verse four, which says, where the messengers said, this man deserves to have you do this. Namely, the, the man is the centurion. The, the second opinion is in verse six, where the centurion, they quote him saying, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. So notice the contrast. His friends say, Lord, he really deserves this, and he himself says, no, I don't. The Jews felt that Jesus owed their friend, the Roman centurion, a favor. 
that he deserved a miracle. Now, sometimes Christians feel the same way today, that if in their viewpoint they need a miracle of some kind, that, that they ought to get it because Jesus is their personal savior. But that, that's not really the humble approach. We're all sinners and any blessing we do get from him comes from his grace, not from our own merit. So the friend said, this man deserves to have you do this, but he himself said, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. The centurion understood that he had no claim on the Lord. His humble faith gave him a high view of Jesus. Here is A.W. Tozer's book, The Pursuit of God. I want to read to you just a little paragraph in here about faith. He writes, Faith is the least self-regarding of the virtues. It is, by its very nature, scarcely conscious of its own existence. Like the eye that sees everything in front of it and never sees itself, faith is occupied with the object upon which it rests and pays no attention to itself at all. While we are looking at Christ, we do not see ourselves blessed riddance. Well, that's what the faith of the centurion did for him. It took his eyes off himself and focused them on Jesus. Here is Andrew Murray's book titled Absolute Surrender. He has a similar comment in this book. He writes, if I am something, then God is not everything. But when I become nothing, God can become all, and everything God in Christ can reveal himself fully. That is the higher life. We need to become nothing. So, the faith that amazes Jesus is humble. That's our starting point. Here's the second lesson we find in this passage. The faith that amazes Jesus doesn't require vis visible proof. In verse 3, it says, the centurion heard of Jesus. Everything the centurion had to go on about Jesus, he had heard from others. He had never really seen the Lord or spoken to him face to face. Now, the Bible teaches that genuine faith always believes in what it cannot see. Hebrews 11.1 1 talks about this. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Here's the greatest example of faith in the Gospels, and it comes from a man who never saw Jesus. Now, because he wasn't a Jew, he was a Roman centurion, he also missed out on all the teaching of the scriptures that pointed ahead to the coming Messiah, who was Jesus, in the synagogues. This man probably never went to a, a synagogue either. He wasn't a Jew, and yet he had pure faith. Now, some people would call this blind faith, but a blind faith has no evidence for its existence. The centurion did have some evidence, namely the testimony of other people. Now that's very encouraging to you and me because like the centurion, we haven't seen Jesus in the flesh, but we have received word about him from Jewish messengers who have, who have given us uh, the message. And we don't have to feel deprived about never having seen Jesus face to face because no one who met Jesus face to face was ever praised like this man was in this passage right here. Now sometimes, in, in, to a certain degree, <clears throat> faith can see. There were two Catholic nuns who worked together in a hospital and they were driving to work one day in the same car, they ran out of gas. Well, there was a gas station pretty close up ahead, so they walked up to the gas station and they were gonna buy some gas and a, and a gas can, too, to carry it back to the car in, but the gas station couldn't sell them a gas can. So how are they gonna get the gas back to the car? And then one of the nuns said, wait a minute, wait, I remember 
we've got a bedpan in the trunk. So they got the bedpan out and they carefully filled it with gasoline. And then they very carefully carried the bedpan back to the car on the highway. And as they were pouring the gasoline from the bedpan into the gas tank, two men were driving down the highway and they were staring at these nuns and what they were doing. And one of the men said to his buddy, Fred, that's what I call faith. <laughs> well, they thought it was just blind faith that the nuns were going on, but really, they didn't know all the facts, did they? And were those two men ever surprised when those nuns went ripping past them on the highway, too? <laughs> now, the way this applies to us is that sometimes people look at our faith in Christ and they say, oh, that's ridiculous, that's just blind faith, but they don't know what we know, do they? And they haven't got all the facts. Faith does see to a certain extent. So the faith that amazes Jesus, though, doesn't require visible proof. Now, point number three. The faith that amazes Jesus transforms your life. For this Roman centurion, faith was no armchair, ivory tower faith. I want to point out three specific ways that it transformed his life and how it transforms our lives. Number one, it gives you love for people the world overlooks. Look again at verse two. There was a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. Now, see that word servant in the Greek language. It's the word doulos, which refers to a, a slave. Now, even in the Bible, they had terms for like a servant who would come in and work, say, from nine to five and get paid for it and be your servant. But then there was a slave whom you owned and was your property, and that's the doulos. That's the word found in here, and the New American Standard Bible translation, which is about the most literal there is, it translates it by the word slave here in, in verse two. Now, it says here about this slave that his master valued highly, uh, valued this slave highly. The, the Greek term is literally precious. The slave was precious to the Roman centurion. The Good News Bible translates that the slave was very dear to him. Now, let's remember in the context of first century Rome that slaves were property. They, they were not uh, people. Aristotle, who was a Greek, but he wrote, <clears throat> a slave is a living tool just as a tool is a non-living slave. Varro, a Roman writer, said, the only difference between a slave and a wagon is that the slave can talk. And the Roman legal writer, Gaius, said that it is well known that masters have the power of life and death over their slaves. So here, this centurion, he, his slave was precious to him. And so it gave him love for people the world overlooks. So who are the people that the world overlooks today? I'll just throw out four examples. One is the people in jails and prisons. I'm so blessed that some of you regularly go into jails and prisons to visit these, visit inmates and uh, do Bible studies with them and things like that. Occasionally, uh, I also go, I've been a couple of times uh, this year. There are people that the world tends to just forget all about and we shouldn't forget about them. We also support, of course, uh, David May and John Sayers, two uh, chaplains with Good News Jail and Prison Ministries in Tulare County as two of our missionaries to whom we regularly give financial and prayer support. 
I, I, I love what they're doing. Another overlooked group of people in our world today are homeless people who live out on the streets and they're cold every night and you know they, they don't have families, they, they don't have medical care, uh, so forth. Uh, a, a third group would be uh, elderly people in, in nursing homes, sometimes totally bed fest, never able to get out of their beds, and sometimes, and not always, but, but sometimes they, they never receive visitors, even from their own family members. And maybe the family members live far away and it's difficult for them to visit, but sometimes they are local and, and they still don't visit. And then a fourth example of people the world tends to overlook are children who need foster homes. Mary and I are so blessed to have five grandchildren. All five of them are up in Sunday school here right now. We, we've had them for the whole weekend. And uh, our daughter, Andrea, and her husband, Daniel, took all five of them in as foster children to begin with, and now they have uh, officially adopted all five of these kids. These are kids whose lives would have really been horrific if, if no one like Andrea and Daniel had come along to rescue them. And, and we just, Mary and I, love them to death. Leslie, we just love these kids. The, these are people the world has overlooked, and if you've got the faith that amazes Jesus, it gives you love for people the world overlooks. Here's the second thing, how way of, that it transforms your life. It gives you love for your enemies. <clears throat> In verse 5, it said, the, the messenger says, and these are Jewish messengers, because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. Now, these are Jewish people talking about a Roman centurion, and the Jews were under Roman tyranny at the time. As a Roman soldier, this centurion could have despised the Jewish people. Most, uh, uh, most of the Romans did despise them. But his faith transformed his prejudice into love. And see that word loves, because he loves our nation. That's the Greek word agapao in its noun form. It's agape. You've probably heard of that. It's the highest form of love there is, always describing God's love for lost sinners, God's unconditional love for us, agape love. That's the kind of love this centurion had for the, the Jewish people. It would be like citizens of Paris today loving members of the ISIS terrorist group. If we heard that the citizens of Paris loved ISIS like that, it would really amaze us, uh, wouldn't it? Now, the first century Jewish historian, Josephus, famous historian, said that every year the Jews would sacrifice a human Gentile because of all the hatred the Jews had for the Gentiles. They'd, they'd actually put somebody and burn them alive on the altar of sacrifice every year to do that. That's what Josephus says. And so the centurion was certainly going against the grain when, when he loved the Jewish nation. And it also says in verse 5 that he built our synagogue. Now the Amplified Bible translates it this way, he built us our synagogue at his own expense. And this showed his love for people who would naturally be his enemies. So I'll ask you, who's your enemy? Now, in the news, especially this year, we've seen a number of examples of how police sometimes, I'm sure this is not true of the vast majority of peace officers, but, but sometimes, uh, you know, police can, can uh, be 
violent for no good reason against, for example, black people. And black people, as a result, tend to feel like the police are their enemy. And so th this is something that needs reconciliation in our nation, the blacks and the police to, to, to learn to love and, and respect uh, each other. So it gives you love for your enemies. And then the third way that the faith that amazes Jesus transforms your life is this, it rests in the word of God. In verse seven, the centurion says through his messengers, that is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. He considered himself unworthy of Jesus, but he still believed that Jesus would help him. Now that is excellent faith right there because many people today who feel so unworthy of God and Jesus and salvation and so forth, because they feel unworthy, they don't dare ask God for forgiveness, for salvation, grace, and, and so forth. Uh, they, they refuse to seek Jesus because they, they feel and they know that they are unworthy. Let me read to you out of this book a little quotation from Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century Baptist pastor who talked about feeling unworthy of Jesus. He writes, a man is never so fit for believing as when in himself he is most unfit. It is unfitness and not fitness that is really required. What is the fitness for being washed? It is filth and filth alone. What is the fitness for receiving charity? It is poverty, abject need. What is the fitness for receiving pardon? It is guilt and only guilt. So if you are guilty, if you are foul, you have all the fitness that is required. So come and find in Jesus Christ all that meets your greatest and most urgent need. Boy, that is really eloquent. I, I love that. If you, if you wait till you're worthy to come to Jesus, you'll never come to Christ. And Jesus invites us to come as we are. Joseph Hart spoke of this in his hymn, Come, You Sinners. And two of the verses read as follows. Come, you weary, heavy laden, bruised and broken by the fall. If you wait until you're better, you will never come at all. Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requires is to feel your need of him. And so no wonder Jesus was amazed at this centurion's faith. It transformed his life. It gave him a love for people the world overlooks. It gave him a love for his enemies, and it rested in the word of God. And that's the kind of faith Jesus is looking for in us. Saving faith saves us from the sinful patterns of our old sinful human nature. All right, now on to point number four. The faith that amazes Jesus submits to his authority. We read about this in verse eight. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, the, the key words in this verse are under authority. This man was a soldier, and as a soldier, he was a man with authority and under authority. With authority because the very name centurion means he had authority over a hundred soldiers. Centurion as in century, a hundred years, hundred soldiers. So he, had, he was a man with authority and under authority. He was used to obeying his superiors and being obeyed. Now, 
Let me show you his logic here. Look at that last sentence in the verse. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. So his point there is to Jesus, if I can order my servants around and they'll do whatever I say, then how much more can you, the Lord of the universe, order this disease to leave my servant and it will obey? Now, notice to the second sentence, how he says, I tell this one, go, and he goes. Stop right there. Here he's saying, Jesus, I can command people under me, go, and they'll go, and therefore, you can command the disease in my servant, go, and it will go away from him. Notice the next part, and that one, come, and he comes. The logic here is, I command people under my authority, come, and they come, and Jesus, you can command health, come, and it will come into the body of my servant. This man had a profound understanding of submission and authority. As a soldier, he had practiced both, and now he applies this principle to the greatest commander-in-chief of all, Jesus. So how do we submit to the authority of Jesus today? We do it by submitting to his word, the Bible. To submit to the authority of Scripture is to submit to the authority of Christ because the Bible is the Word of God. Now, why was slavery so common even among Christians for 1,800 years after Jesus left this earth? <clears throat> it's because the church was not submitting to Scripture. Why was racial prejudice recognized as an evil in America only by the 1960s with the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King and so forth? Why, why did it take that long for us to come to our senses? Because the church had not been submitting to the authority of, of Scripture. Why did the United States Supreme Court recently legalize same-sex marriage in America? It's because the Supreme Court members decided they had to submit to the authority of the U.S. Constitution above the authority of God. And many people would say that they didn't even do that, submit to the authority of the Constitution, because after all, the vote of the nine justices in the Supreme Court was five in favor and four against. So f those four against were, were taking the side that, that God wanted them to take and w were showing submission to the, the word of God in that. <clears throat> now, why do many church leaders today say that Jesus is not the only path to salvation and to God? Because they have not submitted to the authority of scripture. That's why. There was a Christian woman, very old, very small, very frail, uh, helpless, basically, although she could get around. She lived all by herself in the house. And one night she was startled out of her sleep because she heard an intruder breaking through the front door. And sure enough, the man did break through the front door. And he was rummaging through her valuables and she kind of snuck up behind him and she surprised him and shouted a Bible verse at him. She said, stop, Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38 is a Bible verse that says, repent. Well, as soon as the man heard that, he raised his hands in surrender and stopped dead in his tracks. The old lady called the police and the police came and she told them what she had done. And as the policeman was handcuffing the burglar, the policeman s said to him, why did you stop all of a sudden just like that? All that old lady did was holler a Bible verse at you. And the man said, Bible verse? She said she had an axe and two 38s.
All of which goes to show that there is authority in the Word of God <laughs> that, that we need to submit to. Are you sum in submission to the authority of Christ? A young couple once came to me, asked me if I would perform their wedding ceremony. So I was getting acquainted with them and I, could, I learned that she was a Christian and he was not. So I shared the gospel with him and told him the story of Jesus coming and loving us and dying on the cross, so forth. And I said, uh, would, would you like to become a Christian today? Would you, would you like to have Jesus as your personal savior? And he said, no, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. So I turned to his fiance there and I, I said to her, it is not God's will for you to marry this young man because he does not submit to your master, the Lord Jesus Christ. I quoted to her 1 Corinthians 7, 39. A Christian woman is free to marry any man she wants except he must be a Christian. I also quoted to her 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with non-believers for they are not fit mates for you. And tears started coming into her eyes. They left my office. A couple of hours later, she called me back and she said, okay, I, I know, I guess he's not a Christian, but I love him so much. And I said to her, well, do you love Jesus supremely? A couple of days later, she came back in person to my office and she said to me, I need you to pray for me because I've broken off the engagement. I want to do this God's way. Maybe you, uh, she was in submission to the authority of Scripture. And maybe that, her, her example, amazes you. But better yet, it amazes Jesus. And that, that's the wonderful thing. So the faith that amazes Jesus submits to his authority. Number five. The faith that amazes Jesus believes him for great things. In verse 9, we read, When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Now, Jesus, we remember, often rebuked his disciples for their little faith. Remember that? O oh, ye of little faith, often. But here he speaks of great faith. And the verb found, he says, I, I haven't even found that in, in Israel, implies that he's looking for great faith. He was looking for it in the people of Israel, and today he's looking for it in us. Now, see that word found, I have not found. That, that's the same Greek word that we know, and this is how you say it in Greek, Eureka! Somebody tell us what Eureka means in English. Right, I have found it. Eureka is the actual motto, the official motto of the state of California. Now, in the story of Eureka, Archimedes was getting into the bathtub, and as he went down into the water, he saw the water go up, and he, he, it dawned on him the whole principle of displacement and so he shouted eureka you know I, I've, I've discovered the, the principle of specific gravity the displacement and so I, I found it and that became a famous story and, and today you know it's the motto of the state of California well Jesus uses that same word here in verse 9 that Archimedes used <laughs> in the Greek text and and so uh, Jesus is looking for great faith in us. So that brings up the question, what is great faith? Here's my definition of great faith. Great faith is simple faith in our great Savior. Imagine two men in a little rowboat and they're going down the river and they, they don't realize it at first but there's a 
gigantic waterfall they can't possibly survive uh, that they're heading toward. And they, and they start to see it over there. And the people on the shore start shouting to them and warning them, there's a waterfall up ahead. You got to avoid that. So they start, the, the two men in the rowboat start trying to row the boat the other direction towards safety. But the, the current is just far too strong for them. They, they can't and, and they're headed for certain destruction over the, the waterfall. And so somebody from the shore throws them a rope. And the first man in the boat, he, he reaches out and he lays hold of the rope. And then the second man in the boat is just about to grab hold of the rope also when he sees a log floating by. And so he, he figures, well, that I don't know what he figures, but he grabs onto the log instead. And, and we know what happened to those two men, don't we? The man who had his hand on the rope was pulled to safety. The man who grabbed a hold of the log went over the edge and perished. And so in our lives, it's, you know, the, the current that we is stronger than we are is the current of sin in our lives. It is, it is taking us down the path toward destruction. But Jesus is on the shore and he throws us the rope of faith and we grab on to his rope of faith with the hand of confidence and Jesus pulls us ashore. But then this log comes along that we could also grab and that's the log of our own good works. And we say, you know, is, isn't this great? You know, my, my good works, it floats in the water and I won't drown if I hold on to that, but, but the good works are, are not going to save us uh, in the end. So again, great faith is simple faith in our great savior. And then the sixth and final lesson here is this. The faith that amazes Jesus continually grows. The end of the story in verse 10 records, then the man who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Now, the servant, uh, the centurion, received his request, healing for his servant, but not in the way that he thought it would come. Back in verse 7, his message to Jesus was, say the word and my servant will be healed. But guess what? Here in verse 10, Jesus doesn't say a word Jesus doesn't say to the messengers, go, his servant has been healed. Be it done to him according to his faith. He, Jesus doesn't say that. He commanded the sickness to leave without a word. All of which teaches us that when Jesus finds great faith, he wants to make it greater. He was amazed that this man's faith exceeded the faith of others, but he wasn't content to let it stand still. When the friends reported to Jesus, when the friends reported to the centurion that Jesus spoke no word of cure, the centurion probably went like this, you know, oh boy, why didn't my faith measure up to Jesus' power? And in this life, we never arrive at perfect faith, do we? And that's why at the top of our church bulletin for decades now, our church motto reads, a church for people on the grow. That, that's what God wants us to see, people on the grow. Your Lord will always give you new opportunities to trust him. Now, I've been a Christian for more than 60 years, and I've been a pastor for almost 40 years now, nonstop. And you might think, well, Pastor Tom knows how to trust the Lord. He, he has so much experience trusting the Lord. I think he's probably got that down pat. Well, last February, our son, Tommy, graduated from the California Highway Patrol Academy. And that Mary and I drove up there that day for his graduation ceremony. And after the ceremony was over, I said to Tommy, I said, Tommy, are, are you afraid because of all the dangers of your job, you're gonna be pulling people over in the middle of the night and you know, you, they could shoot you or something. You know, are, you, are you afraid? He said, oh no, dad, no, 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 not at all. And I said to him, well, good, because I've got enough fear for you and me. <laughs> <laughs> a 
I remember years ago, Mary Ann Regeer right there, when her husband, Doug, right there, was a California Highway Patrolman. Mary Ann told me, uh, it's been a real struggle trusting God to bring my husband home safe every night and alive every night. And uh, just something I have to trust God for. And, and now I'm going through it, and Mary's going through that too. And so even if I do have experience in faith, trusting the Lord for various things, this year he's, he's teaching me a brand new lesson in faith, trusting him for the safety of our son. Okay, now on to my action step. Ask God to give you amazing faith. The story teaches us that we can amaze Jesus, but only by our faith. Jesus was never amazed at anyone's wealth, intelligence, social status, or possessions. It's not great fortune, but great faith that amazes Jesus. So ask God to give you amazing faith. Let's pray toward that end right now. Dear God, give us amazing faith. Stretch us until we trust you for greater things. May others be amazed at our faith so they can see what, amaz what an amazing Savior Jesus is and trust him for this life and the next. Amen. I will rest in your love, put my trust in your goodness, and set my thoughts on peaceful things above. I will cast away my care.